Good morning. Good morning. If you've got your Bible with you this morning, open to Matthew chapter 5. And if you don't, we will bring a Bible to you. The ushers will bring a Bible. The, uh, it's one of the Sundays that it's kind of important to have a Bible in front of you. Because, and it's every Sunday, but this Sunday particularly, we're going into Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the big chunk, his very first volley, the big sermon, that kind of says who he is and what his message is. So it's important, it's huge. It's almost so big we overlook it or kind of put it aside or maybe become so familiar with it that we don't give it its due. So Matthew chapter 5, and you'll see right away there, I hold familiar words that you might have seen stitched on those little cross-stitch pillows or on bumper stickers, and that's good, but that's just kind of a case. There's so much more there, so much. Understanding the message, then, and teachings of Jesus Christ is impossible without first understanding the meaning of this phrase. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see that there? Beginning with what has been called the Beatitudes, which is a Latin word you don't need to know, and nobody knows what it means, so we can forget about it. Because they're really blessings, and we about that. Understanding the message and the teachings of Jesus Christ is impossible, I would say, without first understanding this phrase. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, to be a Christian is to know, follow, and to obey Jesus. To become his disciple, it is impossible without first believing the prophecy and the warning of John the Baptist that we call it right, echoed by Jesus as he shows up as they show up saying the same thing to start this whole thing, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come here. And now Jesus says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you see the connection? How it starts. So Jesus steps into the scene of human history by making this boldest of claims. His kingdom, though it is not of this world, is coming in a matter of time. And God is bringing it. As soon as God decides to, to end this world's twisted and tired reign and return at last, he will come again to us. The kingdom of heaven is near. You see, it applies to us as well today. Because God will always light a candle in the darkness. God will always catch us no matter how far we fall, and we are never beyond God's reach. The kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus calls the disciples, the curious, and the crowds to gather the seekers, the ones who would become followers, the curious, and he teaches them a life perspective. He aligns their life with the Word of God. He teaches them what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven while still living in the world, facing the trials, turmoils, and snares that come with life on planet Earth. And this is how it starts. Having inspired thousands of followers, Jesus now begins to teach them. Out on the mountain, it says, his true identity, which is the Son of God, his true teachings, which is the gospel, the good news, that God loves them, the world's true nature, though fallen, it is redeemable, and God still loves it, and most importantly, his followers' true mission, to become and then to make disciples of all nations. It's beginning this sermon on the mount, and his message, his teachings. See, God, because of his love, has decided to bless you and us. The world, because of sin, death, and the devil, one of Luther's favorite phrases, attempts to deceive us and take it away or cheapen it or twist it. But Jesus wants you to follow him because of who he is. Okay? In spite of who you think you are or what you've done, it's beginning. So Jesus starts this first of his five discourses or sermons or lessons in Matthew chapter, in Matthew's gospel, this one in chapter 5, with one word. Do you know what it is? It's in your Bible. It is blessed or blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There it is again. It is impossible to understand what Jesus is teaching without making the connection between blessed are the poor in spirit and theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's the key to understanding everything in the next three chapters. 
When the word blessing shows up in the Bible, if it's referring to God, it means praise God and blessed be God. When it refers to humankind or us, it means happy. We're happy because of who God is. You see that? So one way to begin to understand this is, is to think of it like this. You can have transcendent happiness or happiness about the life outside of this life so long as, or as, as long as, you put God first in your life. You can bet your life on the fact that a God-shaped and a God-centered life will bring happiness that you may not have ever felt before or haven't felt for a long time. And it's still available to you. So the entire sermon, these three chapters you have in Matthew's Gospel hinge on accepting the fact that God's plan is better than yours. That God's ways work better than your ways and they're better for you. And it turns out that Jesus' followers are happier because they trust God more than anything or anyone else. God lines things up for us and it works. So tell me, who is more trustworthy, more loving, more helpful, or more truthful, or more generous than God? Let's pray. Jesus, you waltz into this world of the crashing good news. And you unhinge the ways of the world that assault us. And you give us good news. And you remind us how blessed we are because of you. And so guide us to make every step in your way to follow, to become disciples, to make disciples to evangelize, bring the good news, that we would return to a happiness that the world needs and that we maybe haven't had for a long time. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 5. Here we go. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now jump to verse 10. <clears throat> Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the beginning and the end of that section. I trust you know in the middle, because they've been around a long, long time, and they're great words to repeat. And maybe they're on a pillow at your house. Blessed are you when people insult you and continues, persecuted you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because your, great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, if you're watching and in your Bibles at home, you know I skipped the meek, the, those who hunger thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and I did that on purpose, because I trust you've read that before, and you know that, and we'll go past that, because there's more that maybe we don't always get to in this, these chapters that I want to talk about this morning. Because if you really don't understand that first part, right, the poor in spirit and how they are blessed and that theirs is the kingdom of heaven, you won't understand the rest. So we'll, we'll kind of focus on that to begin with. The poor in spirit are those who are rich or God. The poor in spirit are those who understand God's ways and have a sorrow about how things have changed and how they aren't, how they should be. That's, those are those who mourn the next category. They are sad about the state of the world and they long for God to restore it. These are really eight descriptions of the blessed and they stand in opposition to how the world sees the blessed, right? The rich, the famous, the skinny, the fast, and the strong. Those are the blessed ones in our culture, are they not? Well, Jesus comes in and says, no, it's those who are mourning, those who are poor in spirit, those who are persecuted for my sake. And we're going, huh? Doesn't look like that from here. That's because we're not, he's not from here, okay? turns it upside down. He says, you're blessed when you're persecuted, when you mourn for the state of the world, when you are poor in spirit and put God first, okay? In other words, you can lead a God-happy life in terms of how God views you when you're poor in spirit or other, in other words, put Him first above yourself. You can go about doing kingdom work that Jesus will call you to do as soon as your priorities are in order, okay? In other words, you will receive in full measure what you give, more accurately, who you are in Christ. So down the list, if you show mercy, you will receive mercy because you're merciful. Makes sense? Now there's a danger in this Sermon on the Mount, and maybe you've already picked up on it. 
It can sound like so much law. But look carefully who Jesus is speaking to and what he is saying. He wants your attention. And he's correcting the law, but it's filled with grace and mercy and loving kindness. But you have to look close. You have to study. So if you hunger and thirst for God's ways and God's righteousness, you will always be filled because it is God who will meet your every spiritual need and your thirst for truth and love. There's those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so Jesus launches this manifesto, right? His big speech, the king's speech, you might call it, the constitution of this movement which will become Christianity. And it begins linking to the eternal promise God made to Abraham back in Genesis 12. Remember that? I will bless you to be a blessing. So what does God's son Jesus say? The very first speech, the very first sermon? Blessed. Are you connecting? How it comes together. He announces to the world, beginning in the humble fishing villages in Galilee, we studied that a little bit last week, that you can have a, a transcendent happiness that's outside of this world, outside of the happiness you feel sometimes and then don't feel sometimes. An uncommon joy, not only because of who Jesus is, but because who he can make you into. He will change you. Because once you begin to follow his ways and listen to his teachings, you are changed. And once you're changed, you can change the world. Go to verse 13. Here's how he summarizes who you are and what you can do. You are the salt of the earth. Anybody put salt on their food? Does it change the flavor? Of course it does, irreversibly. If salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Well, it can't. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world, Jesus tells them. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your lights so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father. Heaven. You are the light of the world. So Jesus teaches and encourages us. Salt changes everything it touches, does it not? And just like the smallest of lights can scatter any amount of darkness, a person changed by Jesus can change the world. It's the beginning of his speech. But he came to do more than just to inspire and teach, right? There's a lot of folks in history that have done that. Even through the people of God, they come, the prophets come, they inspire, they teach, they rebuke. But Jesus comes to do two more things. And they are kind of in the rest of this Sermon on the Mount. He comes to warn us and to correct misunderstandings. Okay? Because he is both the author of this work we call the Bible and its main subject. Now that's kind of a unique position to be in, right? He created the people he's speaking to, and he was thinking about you. And he said the same, says the same thing to you today. He is the main subject of this word, and his mission is to peel back centuries of misconceptions about God that are in the Bible and how people have taught it wrongly so that they understand really who God is. It's part of his mission, probably the biggest thing he did, because it was buried in layers of empty rituals that they had practiced for hundreds of years, trying to appease God or please God, and Jesus comes to say, no, it's a lot simpler than that. Just listen. I will teach you, and I will show you from the Old Testament, who I am, so that you would know who you are, okay? And had they been paying attention both to the Old Testament and to what Jesus was saying, they might have remembered what Jesus says. Peek over to Matthew 9, 13, because this is picked up in Hosea and Micah. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, Matthew 9, 13. For I have come to call the righteous, not to call the righteous, but sinners. Again, the opposite of what everybody expected. Sinners did not belong with the holy people near the temple, with the people teaching about God. They belonged, I don't know, over there, down the hill, with the lepers, the street walkers, the drunkards. Jesus said, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew 9, 13. Now here's the thing. He came not just to cancel, or not to cancel the law at all, because it's cherished and it's holy and it's still true. There's nothing wrong with your Old Testament, okay? What was wrong in Jesus' day was how it was being taught, and what they emphasized, and the tiny little things they lifted up, which drove people to despair, okay? Jesus came to fulfill what was in the prophets, the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. 
to completely satisfy the wrath of God that is laid out there. We know about that once and for all. So now turn to chapter 5, from, from to verse 17. Because Jesus tells them, well, here's why I'm here. This is it. I do not, do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. That was a way of saying the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them as they could. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, that's like the dot of an eye, he says, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now there's the kingdom of heaven talk again. But that isn't put on a lot of pillows, that verse, is it? This is the tough talk that has to come so that they can see that those who were teaching were teaching falsely. And the talk has to get tough. No one talks tougher than Jesus. Do you know why? Because salvation is at stake. Okay? No stone is to be left unturned. Misconceptions will not be allowed. That it must be corrected. That's why Jesus starts this great teaching with the reminder that God works in the opposite ways that the world works. Okay? God's highest values are not the values of this world. It's upside down and inside down. The followers of Jesus need to know from the start that his kingdom is not reserved for the richest, for the most famous, the strongest, or even the skinniest, but offered exclusively, exclusively for the humble part, the contrite of spirit, remember the Beatitudes back in the beginning, and those who are gentle in all their, in all their ways. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So in 10 verses, Jesus describes how God will measure the heart of every human being, whether they are part of the kingdom yet or not, or part of the kingdom of this earth. So what do we do with the rest of this sermon? What do we do with chapter 6 and chapter 7? Because it's, I have to confess, it's a big chunk. You know that, it's in your Bible. Because it stretches two and a half more chapters. Now this is how it starts. Now what's he going to say next? What issues or life events does Jesus cover? Are you ready for the list? It's in there. He teaches about violence, greed, hunger, divorce, worry, prayer, reconciliation, justice, salvation, marriage, sex, lust, money, persecution, integrity, authenticity, honesty, and righteousness. And that's just the beginning. It's all in that sermon. Churches preach for months on these two chapters, by the way. So I don't know what we're trying to do in the morning. We're giving you an introduction. We're telling you what's in there. We don't have time this morning to cover it. You've got to take it home with you. You've got to apply from this list of what is in life to what's in the Bible, to what Jesus teaches, so that you've got a word, a promise, so that you're not feeling like you're forgotten. Jesus takes on no less than six of the most thorny challenges for human beings in this sermon. He teaches on love, retaliation, oaths in the name of God. This is in chapter 6. Jealousy and anger that can kill relationships and lead to murder. It is viewed the same by God. Anger and murder, same. Jesus has absolutely no fear in what he says. He tells men that when they look at pornography, they may, might as well be paying a woman for sex. It's in your Bible, fellas. He tells all of us that unresolved anger is as bad as killing someone. Wow. Now that's not a, a pillow that I've seen prostitutes lately. Okay, it's the tough talk the world needs to hear. They need it then. We need it today. But it needs to be laced with a promise and a blessing and an offer of forgiveness and reconciliation and renewal. It's also weaved in there, but you got to look close. And you got to trust that it's going somewhere. Jesus teaches that the marks of the Christian life are fasting. How many of us practice that? That's kind of quietly done, I think. Giving to the poor and praying as if you expect God to do great things. Because God can do great things. Now that's the Lord's Prayer. That's also in there. We can spend a few weeks on that as well. But Jesus teaches to pray like your life depends on it. Because your life depends on it. Okay? It's in both chapter 6 and chapter 7. Get a God-shaped perspective on your life 
and begin to give generously because it makes a difference to how people see Christians, how they see God when Christians serve and when Christians give and when we're generous. People notice. And they want to know more about the God we serve. And so finally, Jesus warns the new subjects in the kingdom that they are to judge themselves first before they judge others. And that's in there too. He warns us to be careful how we minister to others to avoid casting pearls before swine. That's in that section. Which means really just maintain good boundaries in your ministry, in your caring. Okay? He teaches that those who were ask a little of God in prayer get exactly what they ask for. A little bit. Okay? So ask much. Ask a lot. Ask, seek, and knock. Go after what God has for you. And trust that it's God. Okay? It's all in there. He warned that the gate to eternal life is narrow. The road to destruction is wide, flat, and smooth. It's a four-lane highway. There's no hills or curves. It's easy. Okay? He cautioned that true leaders are known by their fruit, and false leaders the same. And wait for the season, for it to ripen, and you will see what it is. By their fruit, you will recognize them. It's also in this sermon. Last of all, Jesus taught that a house built on a foundation of sand will crumble as quickly as it is built even though it's by the beach, okay? So build your house, the house of your life, on the rock that will last forever on Jesus Christ. Now I said there's a ton in there, and then you know this, and you've got a Bible, and I hope that there's some markings and some highlighting in chapters 5 and 6 of Matthew, because it's Jesus' sermon on the mom, it's big stuff. And you may recognize there, right? Chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. But look at chapter 7. We call chapter 6 the Lord's Prayer. Let's call chapter 7 the Disciples. Prayer. Verse 7 of chapter 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. I wonder if we shouldn't pray that every Sunday as well. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks the door will be open. Which of you if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will give him a snake? If you then were, though you were evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the Law and the Prophets and all that. should sound familiar to you. It's called the Golden Rule. It has weaved its way into our culture. Did you know it comes from the Bible? It's there, and it's true. So Jesus teaches in 10 minutes, the Disciples' Prayer, Chapter 7, what the scribes could not understand because their minds were dark. But the Pharisees refused to see because it didn't serve their purposes. They were not humble before God. They had a system and it worked. They didn't have a relationship with God. That's the difference. And that's available to you through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Now that's the biggest difference of all. They had the Old Testament. It was great. It was God's Word, but it got off. It got twisted. It started to serve themselves. Now you've got Jesus saying what it means and the Holy Spirit filling you with this living word. See the difference? That's why it still works today, 20 centuries after Jesus stood and spoke for a few minutes on the, on the mountainside. And people said, there's something about this guy. What is it? Okay, so what you're telling us, Pastor, is that God weighs our hearts and watches our serving so that one person at a time, one day at a time, the world is getting gradually and gradually more like God wants it to be or better. Right? But it's not for everybody. It's not. Because not everybody can do that. Here's what that looks like. Not everybody gets it. Not everybody is willing to. You see, here's the deal. God respects our freedom too much to take it away from us. Even though God could. Right? He could make us believe. He could turn a switch and we follow. That's it. But see, God wants your love only if it's genuine. If it's true. The very thing that makes us most like God, our freedom, the same thing is the same thing we could use to reject God. So in order for it to be a genuine love, it has to be free. So God gives us that option, that choice to love Him, to follow Him, or to reject Him. They're both options. But if it's genuine, and if it's our free will, then we know that God knows that it's true. That we actually love Him. And so Jesus warns us, make it true. He loves us too much that we would not hear the truth that He died to protect. Okay? 
So now fast forward, chapter 13, or verse 13 of chapter 7. Enter through the narrow gate, right? For, the, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Not everybody does. We wish they would. We've got to still try, but not everybody will. And then he warns us, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. And a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Jesus makes it clear, doesn't he? Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire, thus by their fruit you will recognize them. See, he weaves the warning with promise so we can recognize it, that it's for us. That we need not go down this road. It's not just an easy thing that Jesus comes to save us from. See, not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. He says, Away from me, the evil doers. Not everybody gets it. Do you? Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the one who builds his house on the rock. So how does this sermon come to an end? What are verse 28 and 9? When Jesus finished saying this thing, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. They were astounded. They had never heard this before as clearly and as simply as Jesus put it. But it wasn't all the mushy, creamy, marshmallowy love. It was a warning as well. It links with repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. It connects with blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom. The kingdom is here. And if you want to be part of it, just listen and follow. It applies to you and me. It really comes down to this. He came to teach one thing. It's not because of what you do, but because of what you've done. It's because of who you are as a result of who Jesus is. See that? That changes everything. Jesus lays it out there and says, well, there's a warning, there needs to be redemption, there needs to be forgiveness and reconciliation, and I'm here to do it. Okay? It's not because of what you do, but who you are because of who Jesus is. But still follow, still do these things, still become disciples. Just get him in the right order. See, the world is the way it is, not because God's arm is too short, or God doesn't love us, or his power is limited. The world is the way it is because of sin and brokenness. But we can be the way God wants us to be because of the cross. It's both. The way the, the, way the world is is still the way the world is. It's the world for which Jesus dies. And it's a shadow of the world to come, and it's what we've got. It's why that list is so long. And a lot of folks, maybe a lot of us, spend a lot of time on this list of how things are without understanding how things could be or hope in heart. Remember that list? Violence, greed, hunger. It's in your Bible. Persecution. So we are who we are because of who Jesus is, and hope is what hope is because of what Jesus promised. And that's what we cling to today. We can't either to endorse or condemn the world, but to restore it what it once was and transform us into who he needs us to be for the sake of those who've forgotten to whom they belong. Those who have for the moment are who are struggling to remember who they really are. That's you. Humble in spirit, mourning for the state of the world, hopeful for God's res return and restoration. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Amen?